your boy Right Guys back with another Right Guys video. The home of common sense, truth, and funny. You know, the model become exceptional or suffer. Now, I was sick yesterday, but I'm feeling better today. So if I sound a little bit low energy, that's why. But um, yeah, I'm still in Pakistan. I have about a week left. Um, it's been amazing so far. I still need to get some more footage out to you guys. I'm gonna have that out by tomorrow night. I think on the on the U.S. end. But in the meantime, I saw this podcast with Stephen Bartlett and Dr. Gabor Mate. And so Dr. Gabor Mate, let's look real quick what he is, if you guys don't know. Gabor Mate is a Canadian physician. He has a background in family practice and a special interest in childhood development, trauma, and potential lifelong impacts on physical and mental health. So that's who he is. I recently, I think, became privy to him when he was on Piers Morgan talking about the whole Israel-Palestine conflict. But he's a real knowledgeable guy, especially when it comes to medicine. And in this podcast, he was talking with Stephen about how repressed emotions can lead to physical illnesses. He had a saying in this video where he goes, when people don't know how to say no, the body will say no. And I just thought it was really interesting. Like he had all these different links to what type of illnesses manifest when you repress certain emotions. And I feel like a lot of people don't know about the correlation between these things and the possible negative impacts. So I just wanted to talk about it and kind of just start a discussion on my channel, if anything. But yeah, let's just get into it. But there's been studies on ALS patients. They're extraordinarily nice. So um, there was a, from the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, a major referral clinic, two neurologists published a paper at an international ALS or motor neuron congress. Why are ALS patients so nice? And what they described was that when people came to their office for diagnosis before they met the physician, they had underwent EDX electrodiagnostic testing of their nerves. And the technicians who perform the test would write on the side of the test, this person can't have ALS, she's not nice enough. Or I'm afraid this person has ALS, they're too nice. And the physicians, the neurologist specialists said, despite the shortness of their contact with their patients and the obviously unscientific nature of their observations, invariably they turned out to be right. And then I called Dr. Wilburn who did this study and I said, what did the other, step, what did the other neurologists say? When you presented this, they said, I said, yeah, we all noticed this. We just can't explain it. Since then, there's been a study where they've asked neurologists about their patients. And the answer is all our ALS patients are extraordinarily nice. Now, what the neurologists don't do is they don't make the connection. That, that, re, that, 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 that niceness is a repression of healthy anger. And that repression of healthy anger plays a role in the onset of that disease. Right now, he was just kind of talking about people pleasers or people who are just too nice in general about uh, how a lot of the times these people can just have repressed anger, actually, because they're always so nice and they're not being authentic and genuine to themselves or in the moment. And so now this repressed anger causes diseases. And this repressed anger causes AL ALS, which is a fatal motor neuron disease. It is categorized by progressive de degeneration of nerve cells in the spinal cord and brain. ALS affects voluntary control of arms and legs and leads to trouble breathing. ALS does not affect intelligence, thinking, seeing, and hearing. Hmm. Very interesting. So why do I ever about very nice people? Because they're putting themselves at risk. Again, niceness can come from genuine concern for others, but that's not accompanied by an ignoring of yourself you also care for yourself then you can be as nice as you want but you also know how to say no and you also know how to set boundaries you know how to say, and you know how to be angry if you need to be but the niceness that comes from self-repression that's the one that hurts there's clearly going to be a lot of very nice people hearing that uh, <laughs> that know they're nice that know they're people pleasers that know yeah. they've experienced in their lives the consequences of putting everyone else before themselves. Yeah. I can, it's funny, as you were talking, I was thinking about the person that I know who I think is nicest. Yeah. And that individual is sick all the time. Yeah. And 
I just connected that dot in my head. But I remember making a joke to her about, oh, you're, you're sick, so like, whatever, you're sick a lot. And then also thinking, oh, my God, she is probably the nicest. N- nice is an interesting word because that can be misconstrued as, like, hiya, or, like, you know, yeah. saying nice things to someone else. But it's really at a deeper level f- from what I've observed in that person, putting everyone else before them exactly. or chronically serving other people's needs before their own. Well, so my contention is, as I said earlier, when people don't know how to say no, the body will say no for them in the form of illness. Mm. And, for, and for a lot of people with serious illness, the illness is the wake-up call. Yeah. And they actually learn. And when they do, that can make a difference to the course of their illness. Sometimes, not always, but I've seen examples of remarkable healing when people learn to say no and stop being people pleasers. And I just only wish that physicians understood this. So when somebody comes to them with chronic eczema and all these other chronic conditions, they will not just provide the physical treatment, but they will also talk to the person about how much stress do they taking on. It's very stressful to take on everybody else's issues. See, I like him. He's advocating for more of a holistic approach in medicine, which isn't talked about as much as it should be, which is exactly what he's saying. Because it's like it's interesting that he said that some of the illnesses in these people would subside once they express their repressed emotions so like for example stop being overly nice to people or putting their needs behind others like chronically like steven was saying but no that's really cool and i think a type of holistic approach is what we need in medicine because it's very one-sided it's like we only try to cure the symptoms of a thing but it's not so so catered toward trying to cure the cause or prevent the cause even but i love that and ignoring your own. It's very stressful. That stress has a physiological impact on the body. How does someone who is a people pleaser, how do they turn that ship around? Because it's, they'll hear that, but because their niceness or their people pleasing is so deep within them and it started yeah. so early, they're not gonna, they're not gonna change. Most of them won't change. Well, they may change if they get sick, you know, and if they learn something from it. I've had a lot of people tell me that. Um, but it is happens very early, uh, but it's everybody's second nature, not their first nature. It's, it's a very interesting phrase, second nature. It means that it's a first nature. Now, no baby is born as a people pleaser. No baby lies there, no one day old baby lies there thinking, gosh, um, I'm hungry and wet and, 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 and lonely, but gosh, mom and dad have been working so hard, I better not bother them. You know, babies will express their needs very volubly and very articulately and very loudly. That's how we're born. We're meant to be born that way. So that this suppression of that is our second nature. And that first nature never goes away. We can always retrieve it, but you have to become conscious of it. So in the, when the body says, no, I lay out certain principles of healing. Um, in the myth of normal, I will actually teach this exercise. Ask yourself this question. Where in your life are you not saying no? Where, where no wants to be said, but you're not saying it. Like, let me ask you, uh, give me give you an example. Let's say I come to London and, and, and we're friends and I call you up, hey, Stephen, here I am, do you want have coffee? Um, but you've been up all night helping a sick friend or otherwise you're just too stressed to want to meet me right now. Your desire is to say no. But what if you suppress that no? And you say yes for the fear of displeasing me or disappointing me or losing my friendship. If I say no, Gabor won't like me anymore. What's going to be the impact on you if you keep behaving that way? Physically, what's going to be the impact? I'm going to be, I'm going to be more tired, more exhausted. I'm probably going to be more stressed. All that. Yeah. You're going to be resentful. disconnected from. Yeah, exactly. You know, so so it's not a this so this person they need to. I, I teach this exercise in the book about where am I not saying no? And what is my belief behind saying not saying no? I don't want to upset Gabor. It's sort of ironic with what he's saying because in reality, for example, st- the person doesn't actually want to go and meet up with this other person because they feel some sort of way, but they feel as if they're going to be doing a, another person a disservice to them if they say no. 
But since they're not saying no, which they want to say, they're actually doing a real disservice to them because they're not going to be absolutely present in the moment with the other person because of how they truly feel inside. It's like you, th you think you're doing the other person and yourself a service, but you're ab actually doing them a disservice by not being true to your feelings because now you can't give give them your all in the moment. You know? And I think a lot of people don't realize that people who have people pleasing tendencies and I can relate to that too it's just something I've had to work on with my life is like staying true to my actual emotions in the moment and like setting boundaries but yeah interesting well, he's gonna exactly and, 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 I, and I depend on Gabor's liking yes you know uh -huh. uh, which means as a child you depend on your parents liking and you have to just suppress your nose to delight thirdly where did I learn this belief that if I say no I'm not likable or I'm guilty or I'm not worthwhile you know and the fourth question is um who would i be without that belief you know um, and so if, if your friend does this exercise regularly believe me she can turn it around but it takes some practice who would i be without that belief yeah when i put myself in her shoes or i put myself in a people pleaser's shoes i wouldn't i'm a people pleaser in in certain environments but i wouldn't say i am generally yeah um I can imagine someone would respond to that and say, well, I'd lose all my friends. She'd find out who her friends really were. Because the real friends would celebrate it. They'd say, oh, finally, we're so glad to see you being yourself. The friends that were just using her or relying on her to be their supporter um, unconditionally uh, will turn away. And you, know, I you see, people, this is the problem with like being nice counterintuitively it's because people will take advantage of you. And a lot of, I think, people please do not realize that they're being manipulated or preyed upon in certain environments because people will prey upon that because they deem it as a weakness. And it essentially is a weakness, but I'll, he kind of brushed over it really quick. He was saying that the people-pleasing tendency stems from childhood when the a child feels his nose being suppressed by both of the parents and he kind of has to act he has to he feels like he has to please them to get their love or he has to or he they have they feel like they have to be the peacemaker between the parents kind of like the fixer of everything and i can relate to that a lot and i think that's exactly where a lot of these tendencies come from like a turbulent sort of home life accompanied with feeling like you have to do certain things to gain love from other people so and i think the healing just real uh lies in realizing this the, the cause and realizing when you're acting in these sort of behaviors and just becoming more disagreeable and setting boundaries like I was kind of saying before but let's continue say this to people this contest between attachment and authenticity can be a painful one but you can decide which kind of pain you want as a child you have no choice as an adult it's true if you're authentic you might lose some attachment relationships that's going to be painful well, which pain would you rather have? The pain of being authentic and losing some friendships that were no friendships at all? Or the pain of, 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 of losing yourself and all its implications and all its impacts on the body? So um, it, it would be difficult for her, and it's true, some relationships that she has now, they would fade away but my God, she would also attract much more genuine and authentic relationships and her true. And it's strange because the, like the good qualities that they see in other people, they think that they themselves don't possess because of a depreciatory factor within themselves, for example, such as low self-esteem. Because this person has such a level of low self-esteem, they're in their they don't have access or the positive qualities within them are inaccessible to them because of that low self-esteem and they become unconscious. This is kind of a psychological union concept. They become unconscious and then those positive qualities become projected on other people of interest or who they deem of certain value for whatever reason. It's, it's crazy, man. It's like the love that we're refusing to give ourselves, we end up giving to other people. And that goes with the good qualities too that we refuse to see in ourselves. They kind of call it the golden shadow when positive qualities become suppressed and they become unconscious and just projected on to the other. But I, I, yeah, I just love the correlation there. I don't know if, if 
anybody has heard or a lot of people have heard of the Golden Shadow. Because I, I did it until like recently. But when I understood the concept, I was like, wow, that's really true. And that's exactly how it works in reality. Her friends would really celebrate her. You know, now let me tell you something just to quickly to people forget it. There was a um, book written by an Australian nurse about 12 years ago. And she, this nurse, like I used to work in palliative care with dying people, she works with, uh, in hospice with dying people. And these are people who tend to die of, of, of malignancy and chronic illness well before that time. And she wrote a book called The, 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 the Top Five Regrets of Dying People. For anyone. And uh, you know what the top regret was? That I wasn't being myself. That I wasn't true to myself. I wasn't being authentic. That's the top regret of dying people. And and the um, the third one was that I didn't express my feelings for fear of disturbing or, or displeasing others. So authenticity is not just a new age concept. It's actually a central dynamic in staying healthy human beings. Oh, one more thing. So yesterday I was in Westminster Abbey. And I was looking at all these beautifully and articulately worded monuments to all these colonialists, to all the people that oppressed and murdered and robbed and despoiled native people all over the world. They're the heroes of the British Empire. And I think one of the reasons there's such a strong pushback against the idea of trauma in this society is if we recognize trauma, which exists not only on the personal individual level, but very much on the collective level, the ruling elites in this country would have to come to terms with the fact that their wealth is based on the traumatization of foreign peoples, which incidentally was one of the crimes of Harry is that he pointed that out. The, 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 let's face it, the royalty, the wealth that I was born into was achieved at the despoilation and oppression of people around the world. So trauma is not just a personal issue. It's very much a social and collective and historical issue. What's the cure? You know, because if we're, if we're, many of us are byproducts of generational trauma and we're seeking different ways to ease our pain through the, through the means of addiction, whether it's pornography or heroin or alcohol, um, we can't all afford expensive therapists, but we exhibit those self-destructive behavior patterns maybe every single day, maybe with mm. social media addictions or yeah, whatever. Yeah. What, what do we do? Unfortunately, uh, the healthcare systems around the world um, have very poor appreciation of the emotional contribution to people's physical or mental ill health. And most physicians and most psychiatrists are not trained in it. Unfortunately, there's a huge um, gap between science and research on the one hand and medical practice on the other. It's maddening sometimes to contemplate it. Um, so the first step would be to educate the, the caregivers. Just educate doctors about the actual science of the mind-body connection and the impacts of trauma. Educate them. So when you go to a physician with, um, say, chronic fatigue or um, inflammation of your joints, they don't just give you the necessary medication, which I'm not against, but they will also ask you what's going on, you know? so. That's the first thing. Second thing is, let's prevent the problem. Right. So let's support young families to be really there for their kids so that families don't have to struggle economically and their parents are so stressed. Um, as I may have mentioned, I've forgotten now, when parents are emotionally stressed, economically stressed, according to a number of studies, the kids' stress hormone levels are abnormal. And that is a harbinger of future disease. And so let's look after young families. Let's make people feel secure, uncertainty, lack of control, uh, lack of information. These are some of the drivers of physiological stress. So let's create a society where there's a more sense of mutual acceptance and communality and, and, and social support, you know? Let teachers be educated that the kids who are so-called misbehaving 
our kids who are actually troubled, troubled because of stuff at home, and that the solution is not to exclude them or to punish them, but to actually give them emotional support in the classroom and in the schools. Let the schools be. The human brain, I'm quoting a Harvard study, develops um, from before birth. It's an ongoing process that begins before birth and continues into adulthood. The necessary condition for human brain development is safe, uh, supportive emotional relationship with adults. Let everybody who deals with children, from social workers to teachers to daycare workers to kindergarten um, supervisors to the parents, understand the emotional needs of kids and, uh, and provide that safety. Uh, let the justice system, so-called, about which there's very little just, um, uh, in Canada, 50% of the women in jail are indigenous. They make up 6% of the population, 50% of the jail population. You call that justice? You take the most traumatized people who then act out their traumas, and then you punish them for it. So let the medical system, let the educational system, let the legal system understand child development and trauma. Now, in turn... Yeah. I love the solutions that he brings up also in this towards the end, saying basically that we need a more holistic methodology when it comes to medicine instead of people just prescribing them the medicine for their symptoms actually try to get to the underlying possible emotional cause of what they're experiencing so to just try and mitigate and stop all the forms of illness there and besides that educate um or give support rather to young families who may be in sort of troublesome economical situations but what he's really what he's really advocating for is something like a whole social economic emotional reform in society because i think in the west society is very individualistic and that has benefits but a lot of negatives also especially when it comes to familial support and familial structure as opposed to collective societies but um yeah man i love what he had to say in this video i thought it was very important for people to become knowledgeable of the correlation between emotional repression and physical illness um let me know what you guys think in the comments though please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video i'm gonna get more pakistan footage out to you guys by tomorrow y'all can send me topics to cover also at bigmanbuilder100 at gmail.com also follow me on twitter at right guys with two t's at the end thank you for watching right guys tower